remind everyone that we're hoping that you'll all tweet about uh, the best questions that are asked and retweet, vote, etc., so that we can have a best ICFD question. So this session is about embedded languages. And one of the things that we all do a lot as programmers is work with a lot of different domain-specific languages. And many of those domain-specific languages are really, really terrible. And in this talk, Neil will be telling us about how he's doing something about some of that. All right, thanks very much. So this talk is going to be about build systems. So build system takes some inputs, say a C file, and produces some outputs, say an executable. And a general purpose build system is one way you get to control the rules. So you say how the input maps the output. And generally, when you're writing the rules for these general purpose build systems, you have to say two things. What to do to go from the inputs to the outputs, so I compile, I link, and what the dependencies are on each step. So under what situations should I redo these compiling linking steps? So we're all used to kind of general purpose build systems, and by far the most common is make. Uh, so who here in the audience has written a build system using a general purpose build system? OK, so pretty much everyone. Who would say they had an enjoyable and pleasant experience? <laughs> <laughs> we have some masochists over here, but generally it's a frustrating and terrible experience. Well, in this talk, I'm going to show you how you can do it much better using Shake, which hopefully should kill make dead forever. So, when I was doing a lot of work with uh, build systems, there were lots of problems I was bumping into, and I was bumping them into them from really different angles. But I think after years of searching, I finally found the canonical problem that build systems like make have. And you can sum it up in a very simple example, like the generated file problem here. So imagine, in your source code, you have some data, so food on XML. And let's say this is the list of pretenders at ICFB. And you also have a generator program that generates some source code out of this data. So it generates a C file that's, say, an optimized perfect hash, so you can quickly figure out who has come to ICFP and who hasn't. So to build the dependencies of foo.c are both the generator and the data. If you run the generator over the data, and it generates the C source file, but if either you modify your generator or the data, you should rebuild the C file. OK, so that's all easy. But what does, but afterwards you want to compile your C file into an object file. And what are the dependencies on, of the object file? Well, if the C file changes, you should rebuild the object file. But if any of the headers that the C file includes change, you should also rebuild <laughs> the object file. So, can anyone tell me how you're going to figure out what are the headers that are imported by the C file? Yeah, so you're going to look at the file. You're going to look at foo.c and say, what headers do you import? And in shape, this is very easy. So this is the only Haskell code I'm going to show you today. So this is an embedded domain-specific language in Haskell uh, to go along with the session title. So this, this um, declaration says, to build foo.o, well, first, you depend on foo.c. You're compiling foo.o from foo.c, so I need foo.c. And this says two things. It says, if in future foo.c changes, rerun this rule. You'll need to regenerate an object file. It also says, before continuing, ensure foo.c is up to date and available for me to interrogate, so I can look and see what headers it includes. And then, as, as stated, I just run gcc minus mm over foo.c, get the standard output, do some little bit of text munging to get the headers, and then I need all 
the headers that Foo.C has imported. If build systems have been designed sensibly from the start, I wouldn't be explaining this to you. This is just obvious. I want to know what headers Foo.C imports. I look at it and say, ooh, if any of them change, let's uh, rebuild it. And then at the very end, I just compile it with GCC. Fairly direct, basically what you'd expect if you didn't know anything about build systems. Unfortunately, things like make aren't so easy. So the actual rule saying, well, you compile foo.o from foo.c is very simple in make, just the thing at the top here. But to say what the dependencies of foo.o in make is very difficult. I come up with basically two ways you can do this, neither of which is good. So the first way you can do it is you kind of say, <coughs> guess. Give, give me some set script that will kind of munch foo.xml and guess what the output will be. So you can kind of guess the headers in advance. But this sucks, because you have to put your generator logic in both the set script and the generator, and you have to rerun this set script every single time you type make. So even if it has to do nothing, it has to regenerate all these set scripts. The other alternative, which seems like more advanced make hackers do, is to put the list of dependencies in a separate make file and then hash include into the make file. And you can do this, but it's quite tricky. You have to set up the flags. It almost feels like an abuse of the make system. But this doesn't really work if you want to say for all C files, because you have to have some static hash include, which you can't parameterize over. So, there's no real way to do this very simple generated file pattern in Make. And I should say, Make has millions of extensions. And all of them let you paper over some aspect of this problem, but none of them let you do the full solution. So, this is the key difference between Shake and Make. In Make, you specify all of your dependencies in advance. In Shake, you can specify additional dependencies after using the results of previous dependencies. So we can generate foo.c and look at it. Whereas in make, we cannot generate foo.c and then look at it. That's not allowed by the dependency system. And it shouldn't take long to convince you that the dependency system in Shake is strictly more powerful than that of make. And this is really key power when we're doing anything with generated files. And in fact, I would say that a build system which has a static dependency graph, which doesn't let you add dependencies as you're going along, is insufficient for doing anything with generated files. And if you're doing a custom build system, the chances of you not doing anything with generated files is quite low. So we should all ditch these static dependency graphs, which almost all other build systems have, and move to a richer dependency language. So that's kind of the dependency system behind Shake. But Shake is, is more than that. It's also the ideas from functional programming thrown into the mix. So uh, Shake is a build system. So it actually turns out that build systems like Make are very well written. They're highly efficient. Uh, they have very good parallelism. They have, they're correct in most circumstances. So we want to keep all these good bits. Uh, we also want to have the better dependency system that I talked about in the last few slides. We also want to do modern engineering. It's 2012. People expect profiles, analysis tools, lint tools, reporting, HTML generation reports. All these things we can give to make programmers' lives much easier to have, so they can have a good experience with developing build systems. And then finally, we want to shove in some Haskell. It's a domain-specific language, so we pick up things like syntax and types automatically from Haskell. But the key thing we can also steal from Haskell is the idea of abstractions. In Haskell, you've got functions, you've got modules, you've got packages, you've got hackage where you can download other people's packages. All these things that let us reuse build systems if we do them with Shake. Compare that to make where you've got a primitive macro language, no module system, no packages. It just makes construction of large software projects, in this case build, build systems, a much easier task. So here's a pretty picture that you can generate from the Shake output. Um, 
not to go into this too much, but you can see it will tell you how good your power system is and give you little graphs of your defenses. And one of the things that I found so far is that actually for the key building stuff with defenses, Shake is just as good as Mac. Haskell doesn't slow you down at all. So I originally wrote Shake about three years ago, uh, maybe four now, as standard charted. Since then, we've done well over a million runs with Shake, and I can almost guarantee that somewhere right now in the world, a build is being made with Shake. There are 30,000 more build objects coming from over a million lines of source and over a million lines of generated code. So this is a real, practical, large-scale project, and uh, possibly unusually for projects, for most projects, the number of generated files and generated source is quite high relative to the number of handwritten lines of source. So when we first converted over, we had 10,000 lines of makefile, and when we converted, we had only 1,000 lines of shape script. And not only that, but in the days before, if someone got a compile error, I'd often tell them to wipe and rebuild to see if the compile error magically went away. Nowadays, none of that. And it's twice as fast to compile from scratch. So just to kind of focus on that message, when you compare shake and make for one single project, it was 10 times shorter and 2 times faster. So we're functional programmers. 10 times shorter is nothing. We get that all the time. Other languages are just the best. But 2 times faster? That seems worth looking at. So the first way we were able to make things faster was by doing less work. So GCC minus MN actually scans, if you have this setup where you have several C files, all including one common header, if you run GCC minus MN on each source C file, you'll uh, end up looking at the defenses of headers many times. At large scales, this can start to matter. So you could imagine making these changes in a make-based system, but it's a lot harder to do. So, that was one nice improvement. The next, the next thing I'm going to talk about is ge the generated files thing again. So, imagine we've got the system from before. So I've got my generator, and I decide, you know what, I prefer eight space uh, tabs instead of four space tabs. So I go through, and I change my generator, just change the source of the generator. But none of the generated files change. In a make system, uh, a file rebuilds if, it's, if any of its dependencies are newer than it in terms of modification time. So in a make-based system, I change my generator, which rebuilds foo.c, which rebuilds foo.a. Now I'm recompiling and relinking lots of files, even though these C files haven't really changed. In shape, there's a much more refined notion of whether a file of, of what time a file was last modified. It has both the time it was last changed and the time it was last uh, built. So when you uh, rerun the generator, you can see that foo.c is the same as before and cut off the builds. So you regenerate foo.c and then stop. And this can mean the difference of build times going from 2 hours to 15 seconds. It's that dramatic. And this is impossible in make, but just providing the standard and shake. The next way we were able to uh, speed up the build system was by getting more parallelism. Often people will say, oh, there's not enough parallelism, this stage depends on this stage. But often that's because the dependencies are written in overly coarse math. So my, my, my experience is that actually most big projects have perfect parallelism. Certainly if you include steps like the documentation generation, building uh, installers, all those steps, which often people segregate into different phases. So we remove some unnecessary dependencies. Using the kind of cha changing file technique from the previous slide, you can depend only on a sub-part of a file. So you can have a file extract just the bit you depend on, and then depend only on that. Uh, and we don't use phases. If you have, as some people's compilers in the audience, if you build your phase one compiler, then stop, then your phase two compiler, then stop. You don't get any chance for parallelism throughout the whole thing. And you've got overly coarse dependencies. So if you remove the overly coarse dependencies, you can get very good parallelism. And this is just an example running on four cores. And you can see it's done about 30 minutes of 
solid four core processor. The final technique uh, is faster parallelism. Not all parallelism is created equally. If you, if you do the naive thing, often you can end up doing lots of compiling, which is very CPU heavy, followed by lots of linking, which is very disk heavy. And what that means is you get a very hot CPU, followed by a very clunky hard, hard disk. If I have you interleave them more, so you're doing some compiling and linking uh, for the duration, neither, neither of these preferrals are getting so hammered, and you can get much better speed ups. And I found about 20% speed up just by randomizing the thread pool. So, that's very nice. So, inside a back review shape, can the functional programming community use build systems like this outside? It seems the answer is yes. There are already 10 build systems on Hackage that do a full dependency analysis. There are add-on libraries and there are users. It seems to be something that people can actually get their teeth around and is practically useful. So if you'd like any more information, there's the ICFP paper which covers the domain-specific language uh, aspects and the dependency system. But if you're just looking to write real build systems, there's an implementation on Hackage which you can download, has tutorial-style documentation, and just have a play. Thanks very much. We have time for a few questions. <laughs>